to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to bring you a special message from the Word of God. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews, um, standing if you're able. And follow along, we're going to spend most of our time in chapter 11 today, but I want to just read the first four verses of chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, looking at verses 1 through 4, where the scripture says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds." Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Father, may our, our hearts be drawn to the very pages of Scripture today, to the truths therein, as we're guided and directed in that truth. Father, may we take stock of our own life and understand if we need to be uh, more uh, excited and more enthusiastic and more passionate about living a life of faith before Thee. And we'll give you praise and thanks as you instruct us and guide us through Your Word this morning. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Now we're going to start in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. I call this study today, Perfecting Faith. Perfecting Faith. And I call it a a New Year's focus, if you will. As we turn the new year, we uh, nothing. There's nothing special spiritually about a new year. I understand that. We consider a new year to sort of be a time to maybe get a new beginning, get a new start, to put a new emphasis on things, to 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 make better with what we have, or to do better than we've done in the past, or to take new approaches, new avenues. Uh, For the Christian, it's just another day on January 1st, because we should always be striving to please God in all that we do. But for emphasis, uh, we we still uh, put our hearts and minds on things that we resolve to do on January the 1st, thinking about it days ahead and thinking, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And um, it's not a bad idea. In fact, I believe it's a great idea to take a look at the scriptures and see where we are in our walk of faith, to see whether or not we are strong in our faith. And so I call this perfecting faith, if you will. The reason I call it perfecting faith um, is um, we have in... um, uh, In uh, verse 2 of chapter 12 that we just read, we're going to talk more about this later. I just want to mention it as as a beginning point. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author and finisher. The word finisher... Uh, is a word that means perfecter. He's the perfecter of our faith. Uh, the he- book of Hebrews was, was written to believing Jews who were, who were spiritually immature. And the, the book is, is primarily themed at striving to get them to be more mature in their faith. So we turn to a book that's designed to encourage a stronger faith in order to pursue perfecting our faith as we look at the new year. Uh, not that it's, it's not things that we haven't done in the past. There's nothing new here. It's a, it's a time to go back and to uh, refresh our memory on some things and to look at things in perspective of where we are today. 
Uh, some of these things in Scripture we look at and we say, well, I've seen that before. Okay, take that thought and sort of throw it away. We need to look at it again. We can go over and over and over and over again ad infinitum through our lifetime and never search the Scriptures enough. So one more time for those who've been here recently, uh, let's take a look at chapters 11 and 12. And that's a lot of material, so we're not going to do verse-by-verse exposition, but we are going to take a look uh, at most of the verses in these two chapters, at least chapter 11 and then just in the first four in chapter 12. And we want to focus, if you will, on faith. Now, the first thing I want to do is define faith before we get to our our text, if you will. Uh, And that's found in Hebrews 11 and verse 1. This defines faith for us. It says, now faith is, that's the definition right behind it. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So I want to take a moment here. Substance is a word that means assurance. It's confidence. It's absolute confidence. So this is the hope, if you, I mean a substance, if you will. Faith is a substance. It's real. It's assurance. It means that we are sure that Christ is the Savior of the world. We're sure that the Word of God is the truth. We're sure that God created the heavens and the earth, etc., etc. We're sure about it. So faith is that kind of surety, if you will, or assurance. And it also uh, strikes a, a chord of confidence. We're confident about that. It's not that just-in-case faith where, oh, well, just in case I'm wrong, you know, I'm going to do this anyway. Well, for the believer, we don't believe there's anything wrong about putting faith in Christ. We are sure. True believer is positive that the, that the Word of God is the truth. There's no doubt in our mind. Not one shadow of doubt. We are confident. And that's the substance. Faith is the substance of what? It's the substance of things that are hoped for. Um, and hoped for is, is one word in the Greek, and it simply means that we are confident and we expect something. And not only do we expect it, but we're sure that we're going to get it. God promises us an eternity in heaven as an inheritance that he's given to us by salvation through Jesus Christ, through faith in his in his finished work at Calvary, by his shed blood, we're confident that God's going to fulfill his promise. Just as Abraham was confident that God was going to fulfill the promise through him. And in that respect, look, just glance back to Romans chapter 8 for just a moment. Romans chapter 8, and look at verse 24. And we're talking about what we hope, the the hope for. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. So let's put that in perspective here in 8th chapter of Romans and verse 24, uh, talking about um, that hope, if you will. It says in Romans 8, 24, for we are saved by hope. But hope is that, but hope that is seen is not hope. If it's something you can feel and touch, it's not hope. That's not, that's, that's not faith. It's not real hope. Hope is the thing, what does it say? It says, that which is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? A lot of people don't put faith in God. They don't believe the Bible's true because they can't see it. They can't see it. But they don't put hope in it. Look at verse 25. It says, but if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And we're going to come back to patience at the end of our study today. But that hope that we have in Christ, faith is the substance of things hoped for. We're certain. We're sure about it. We haven't seen it. We simply believe it because God said it's true. So we go back to Hebrews 11 and verse 1. So faith being defined here, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Evidence means proof. Proof. Literal proof. It's the proof. What is proof? Faith. 
The thing that we can't see, that we put faith in, the thing that we hope for, because God says that he came to give us everlasting life. Not that any man should perish, but that all would come to repentance. That we would all receive inheritance from God, eternal life with him in heaven. That's God's desire. Now, we hope for that. We put our faith in Christ. And this faith, this faith is evidence. It's evidence. That's what gives substance, if you will, to James when he says faith without works is dead because faith is proof. And if faith is proof, it will demonstrate itself. Can't get saved by works, but once we're saved, that faith will prove out in, the, in our lives as evidence that we actually have put our faith in Jesus Christ. So it's the Evidence, if you will, according to the end of verse 1 there, the evidence of things not seen. And these are important uh, parts, but there's four more things I want to say about faith. And I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget them. First, it's a firm conviction. A firm conviction. No doubt. Completely convicted by the Word of God that He's right. I remember the day I got saved. And that's the one thing that stands out because that day God convicted me that I was a sinner. And I understood it as clearly as I do today, that I was a sinner. I didn't know it before that. I didn't accept it. I wouldn't have never acknowledged it. But that day God convicted me through his word. This faith is really a firm conviction. We are convinced with certainty. So we look at the word of God and the word of God becomes a lie. And it's real. And we put our faith, that means we are certain. We're convicted that it is the truth. Um, the second, by the way, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 for just a moment. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I just want to point out the opposite, if you will. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Good point to do that. The opposite of this convicting, convincing faith. But look at verse 11 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11. The scripture says, and this is talking about the man of sin that's going to come at the end and during tribulation. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe literally the lie. It is the lie, the lie of the devil. That they, in verse 12, all might be judged who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There are people that do not believe the truth and they take pleasure in sin. If sin is a pleasure to us, we don't have faith in God. Because when we sin as a believer, it's going to convict us. The Holy Spirit who lives within us as a true believer will convict us of that sin. We can't have pleasure in it. We can't have pleasure in it. We're not going to practice that according to 1 John chapter 3 because that's evidence, if you will, of unbelief. The second thing I want to say, not only is faith a firm conviction, but it's a personal surrender to God. This isn't a team event. It's not a family event. It's a personal event. Faith is personal. Not because one or two or other members of our family put their faith and so we're going to go along with the program. That's not faith. It's a personal surrender, not a family surrender, not a group surrender, a personal surrender. Uh, and look at John chapter 1 and verse 12. And I'd like to point out some of these others that sort of enhance, if you will, our understanding of the text. But look at John chapter 1 and verse 12. I'm talking about a personal surrender representing faith. In verse 12 of John chapter 1, it says, but as many as received him, that's Christ, to them gave he power to become the children of God, the sons of God, the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. But as many as receive him. Now, um, I'll put some notes in my Bible over that word receive, to receive Christ. Um, it's, uh, it's not that you know about Christ. It's not that you're familiar with Christ. It's not that you're knowledgeable about Christ. It's not that you've heard Christ or considered him or learned about him or studied him. It's that you put faith in him. It's a surrender. The devil knows there's God. 
The devil knows that. But he's not a believer. He's not a believer. There are a lot of people who know about God. They're familiar with God. Maybe even, likely there are many, uh, the, the scriptures tell us that, they're actually attending churches and they come and they go in the church and they're comfortable in the church, but yet they're comfortable in a life where they have pleasure and sin. And so they've got one foot in the world and one foot in the scripture? No, they're just fooling themselves. They're faking it. It's not real faith. It's fake faith. Let's go. Um, <clears throat> so the, the first thing is it's a firm conviction. It's a personal surrender. And it's a conduct that's inspired by that surrender. So when we surrender ourselves in faith, our conduct is going to match that surrender, that that. That statement that we put faith in Christ, our conduct is going to be consistent with that. The fourth thing I put down is that uh, faith is contrasted to natural belief, uh, which is just an opinion, just an opinion. True faith is not an opinion. It's a surrender. And so people say keep the faith. That means keep your opinion uh, positive about something, right? Um, But... Natural belief is just an opinion held in good faith without necessary reference to its proof. So we have proof. Our proof is faith itself. Faith itself. We've been convicted. We're convinced. And we've surrendered ourselves to God. And that is the assurance if you will, that we have faith, and it's the evidence of faith. 11.1 in Hebrews, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we understand it's not that which is seen. We're to keep our eyes on heaven, on God who is in heaven. Keep our eyes and focus on the things above, not the things on earth. The one who has true faith in God is going to keep looking heavenward because we're going to keep our eyes on the Lord. That's where he is. It's where he is, the right hand of God. Now, I'm just going to make an overview here of chapter, that's just the introduction to our study, just defining faith. The first thing I want to say is, um, is that we have examples of strong faith. We have examples of strong faith. And they're found in chapter 11. We call this the hall of faith, if you will. Many refer to it as that. But these are ex- not just examples of faith. What I'm trying to focus on today is perfecting our faith. Strong faith. Not just faith. Strong faith. Now we're going to see strong faith in Hebrews chapter 11. We're not going to look at all these examples and read all of these verses, but I do want to take a look at it. But just by way of an overview, if you will, uh, in verse 6 of chapter 11 is something very important. It says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without this convicting, convincing faith through which we surrender to God, it's impossible to please him. That means we are not able to please God. A lot of people are walking around and they think they have faith in God and they wonder why things aren't going. They can't please God at all. We can't please God unless we surrender to God in faith. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is that in this passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, 20 times the phrase by faith or through faith is mentioned. 20 times. It's faith. This is the hall of faith. That's why it's a hall of faith, because faith is mentioned. All of these things, it records tremendous acts of faith. Strong faith that were exercised by people of old. The saints of the Old Testament is what we see in this. And oh, by the way, Rahab the harlot is included as a saint in the Old Testament. Right? Rahab the who? Yeah, the harlot. She, because of her faith. Faith faith in God, what happens? All of our sins are forgiven. They're gone. Rahab's life was gone, the life she knew once before, because she put her faith in God. And we see her in here. But, so I want to take a look at a couple of these. So let's look, if you will. So right off the bat in verse 4, by the way, it does say in, um, 
in, in verse 2, uh, I want to mention this as well. Verse 2, for by it, that is by faith, the elders, the elders are the Old Testament saints. They're the men of old is a literal translation of that. Some people call them the ancients. Not all of them are men, uh, but um, it's the, the, the Old Testament saints in reality because they all had faith. Faith has always been the requirement to know God and be his child. So in verse 2, for by it, that is by the faith from verse 1, and that's the, the kind of faith that we just described, the elders received witness. Um, literally, if you will, they obtained a good report. They obtained a good report. Look at verse 39 in this chapter. And these all, so at the beginning, it's going to talk about all these who obtained a good report. In verse 39, looking back to those that were just named, it says, And these all, having received a good report, obtained a good report. What? Through faith. They obtained a good report. They didn't receive the promise. None of these received the promise. We haven't received the promise either. Our faith is substance of things hoped for. The hope for is the eternal life that God has promised to us. We don't have it yet. When they exercised their faith, it was still something hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That substance drives us into action to exercise faith towards God to do these things that God wants us to do. And if God's in it and we're willing to do His will, it'll be great. And that's called strong faith. So, um, let's just look at a few of these. Going back to uh, in verse 3, it says, Through faith, there's the first occasion of either by or through faith. Um, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So this is creation. The first thing mentioned in the Hall of Faith, nobody ever talks about. They talk about all of these characters. The first thing talked about is not a person at all, except for the one who has faith. And that is the, that, that by faith, through faith, we understand God created everything. That's really sort of the beginning. It's the beginning of our scriptures. It's the beginning of our scriptures. We have to understand that God is, has no beginning. He has no end. He is eternal, which means there's, there's no end in the, in the past. There's no end or beginning. There's no end in the future. He's eternal. And we put our faith in God, who is the creator of all things. Because he's first. He's preeminent. Everything ex exists, exists because of God. He created everything. Everything. What we have is what he created. And oh, by the way, at the end of this world, God's going to take this world and this heaven and phew, it's going to be gone. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. All these environmentalists are worried about losing the earth. They ought to be worried, if you will, about not having faith in God. <laughs> For they ought to be concerned about because God's going to destroy this world. They're not going to be able to save it. He's going to burn it up. It's going to be gone. It's going to disintegrate. It will not exist anymore. But he's the one who created it. But we, we understand that by faith. That's why people still believe in evolution. They don't have faith in Christ. There are people who tried to mix evolution, if you will, with creation. You can't do that. There is no such thing as evolution. One ounce of evolution means you don't have faith in Christ. It's that, it's that plain. Look at verse uh, 3 again. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. <laughs> so the Big Bang is something that would appear, if you will. Something that can appear. No, it's creation. Creation alone. Can't mix them. Now, verse 4, by faith. By faith, Abel, he offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain did. In uh, verse 5, uh, Enoch, he was translated. He was no more. By faith. Why? Um, he was translated for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. What does verse 6 say? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So we know Enoch had faith. So in verse 6, but without faith, right? We talked about that. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, 
warned of God that rain was going to come. It had never rained before. People thought he was crazy. He had nobody believe him. Nobody. Nobody believed him. He preached for 120 years while he was building the ark. Nobody believed him. Nobody. Because he couldn't see it. Rain? We don't have rain. Flood? Where's all that coming from? Thought thought he was out of his mind. So when you tell somebody that Jesus is real, he's the Lord of lords and King of kings, he's at the right hand of God, he's the Savior of the world, you've got to put faith in him, they look at you like you're crazy. Right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That eternal presence with Christ, is that faith in that gives us substance to talk about. And to make a, we're going to get a good report, if you will, only if we exercise our faith in a manner that's pleasing to God. So in uh, verse 8, by faith, Abraham. And we have a lot of, of, of Abraham in here, and I want to talk about it. But he's the father of faith because he put faith in God. And we studied that recently, um, um, or not long ago, as we were studying through the book of Galatians, and we looked over and looked at Romans quite a bit. But in verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac, if you will, his only son. He offered him up. And you would say, well, I would never do anything like that. God would never ask me to do that. We have to have faith that God's not really, and that's what, that's what Abraham's faith was. He had faith that that wasn't really what God was requiring him to do, but that's what God told him to do. So he's going to do what God told him to do. And it proved out. It was proof. His faith was evidence that God was not going to do that, and he, but he had, to, he had to have faith, and he did. And that was great faith, strong faith. And then in verse 20, uh, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Verse 21, by faith Jacob, uh, when he was uh, dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Verse 22, by faith Joseph when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel, gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw uh, that he was a, a, literally a beautiful child. They were not afraid of the king's commandment. In verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the children of Israel. And in verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ... Get that? Moses, the reproach of Christ. <laughs> Got it? Greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. And it says in verse 27 that he, for, he had, by faith, he forsook, he forsook Egypt. Verse 28, he forsook, um, uh, I mean, he, he, he kept the Passover through faith. Verse 29, by faith, passed through the Red Sea. He was between a rock and a hard spot. There was nowhere to go, nowhere to go. They were dead in the water. That's what we would call it. The Egyptian army was approaching and there was no way out, period. But by faith, God delivered them. He had faith that God would deliver. We need faith even in the most darkest of circumstances like that. We still should have. True faith will still be there when we come to that darkest point in our life. And it says in verse 30 that... Um, the walls of Jericho fell down by faith, if you will. In verse 31, Rahab, we talked about her, that by faith um, perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And then in verse 32 and following, there's a list of a whole bunch of folks. And, and it started out in verse uh, 20, 30, excuse me, verse 32 of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, uh, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And in verse 33, it says that these people, through faith, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of um, weakness were made strong, uh, literally wanted or, or became valiant uh, in fight, turned to uh, flight uh, the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting the deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. God's got something better. 
Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what man does to us on this earth. They can't rip us away from God and take us out of his hands according to Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And in verse 36, others, aside those listed, had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted or tested, they were slain with a sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Strong faith is what we see being exercised through all of these people. All of these people. And they all got a good report according to verse 39. And so um, we turn now to chapter 12. These are the examples of strong faith. Now, um, let's turn to chapter 12 in Hebrews. We've seen these examples of strong faith. Now let's take a look at perfect faith. And that's what we're introduced to in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. We're going to come back to verse 1 in just a moment. First, I want to talk about this examination, I call it, of perfect faith. Jesus was the only one who lived a perfect life on this earth. Perfect. If we want to understand what real faith is, we look at the example of Christ. And we're doing that here. And, you know, and, and you take a look at, at Jesus' walk on earth, you get that in the four Gospels. It's so refreshing to read through there and see how Jesus withstood all of those who opposed him because the whole world was against him except for a few. Except for a few. By far and large, the vast majority were against him. He was living in a world where he wasn't wanted, generally speaking. In verse 2 of chapter 12, um, and I'll just take a look at first, if you will, at the first part of verse 1. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. This great, all these people mentioned in chapter 11, and we're, we're, we're uh, surrounded by, encompassed, surrounded by their witness. It's in the scriptures. We can see it, we can read it, and we know that it's true. And so we, understanding that we have this, in verse 2, we should be looking unto Jesus. The word looking literally means to fix our eyes upon, to focus on. This is an intense focus. If we want, we see the examples of strong faith, and we look at them and say, wow, look at, oh, wow, wow, look at that. We're in awe because he did these great things and we have a tendency to want to elevate them on some pedestal. No, they were just people like you and me who exercised strong faith in the Lord. And God used them mightily. It's not our strength, our power, our ability, our knowledge, or our wisdom. It's all God's. It's God who worked all these things through those people. So we don't need to elevate the people or lift them up. We simply are reminded of what God did through a group of people. They're found there in chapter 11. And they're not the only ones. We can search the scriptures and see, see God's hand in the lives of so many people who lived lives of strong faith. And that's where we need to focus. So we need to focus upon Jesus. Not on the ones who were mentioned in chapter 11. We want to keep our eyes on Jesus. People say, well, I want to be like Abraham. I want to be like Samson. I want to be like, no, we want to be like Jesus. We look at people that live around us. They seem to be people of great faith. Their lives seem to be so successful. That's not the evidence of true, true faith. Just because their lives are successful. That's not it. There are people who are destitute, there are people in prison, there are people who are wanting, people who are persecuted, who are living a life of strong faith before the Lord, and we don't want to emulate those and we don't want to elevate them. Folks need to take our eyes off of people, off of people. I remember right in the first few weeks I got saved, my preacher said, and he made a practice of it, I remember him saying it right from the very beginning, take your eyes off of me and put them on the Lord, because people have a tendency to believe uh, the person who's leading them, or somebody else who seems to be a good example, or somebody who seems to be successful. Remember Jim Jones? 900 and some people went off and took the Kool-Aid, right? Because of a man, because of a man. 
They trusted in what he was teaching. They trusted that he was right. We need, I don't care who it is preaching, if it's me or somebody else preaching or teaching the word of God, we need to check them out by the scriptures. Because our trust is in God, our faith is in God, and if we're going to have, if we're going to have strong faith in the Lord, we need to look first at Jesus. Yeah, we can be reminded of all these things, and it's evidence, evidence of what can happen. Good reports there, and we want a good report too. Can't get a good report if we don't have faith. Have faith, we need to have strong faith. Now, it says here, we need to focus on Jesus, literally intently subjected to him uh, as the focus. He's the object of our faith, we might say. Looking unto Jesus. Now, this follows a chapter that tells us what faith is, shows us how faith was exercised, tells us what faith is not, and tells us that people got a good report by doing this. And so we also are compassed about with these witnesses in verse 1 of chapter 12. And so we should be focusing on Jesus. Why? It tells us. Because he's the author of our faith. He's the source of our faith. He's the initiator of our faith. It's Christ. It's Christ. And not only is he the source of our faith, but according to the scriptures, he is the, and by the way, that, 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 that word there, uh, the author, is used in scriptures. It's a word that means pioneered, pioneered, um, because we saw back where, um, you know, Moses, by faith in Christ, right, Christ paved the way even before he was born. He pioneered that path of faith, and we look at his life on this earth, we'll see that perfect path of faith. And so he is the initiator. He is the, the originator. He's the author of our faith. And he's the finisher. The word literally means perfecter. He perfects our faith. Um, and Christ ended his life successfully. That's what we've got to keep our mind on. It was that, well, he was, he was killed. No, he gave up his life. Nobody killed him. He gave up his life. They took him to the cross, crucified him. But the scripture tells us that the moment that he passed away, he gave up the spirit. He surrendered his life for you and for me. He gave up his life. Um, it's a shame what, what they did to him, but all part of a plan. So in that sense, it was God's perfect plan from beginning to the end of his life on earth. It was a perfect plan. And it continues in perfection where he is, at the right hand of God. So we understand that this, perf this perfecting, if you will, uh, is a process by which we look to the author of our faith and the one who can perfect our faith. It says he's a perfecter of our faith. But look at this. He finished successfully, and he did. He did what he came to do. He came to be the supreme sacrifice the precious lamb without spot before God who shed his blood for the remission of sins. And it says it characterizes this at the end of verse two. It says who for the joy that was set before him, the joy. Remember he, his, his path, his path was to the cross in this life path was to the cross. The joy that was set before him because the end of that path, that wasn't the end of his life. Death is not the end of our life if we have faith in Christ. Second Thessalonians talks about, I mean, first Thessalonians about the fact that we sleep. There are other places in Scripture that our body goes into the grave, but to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we leave our body and we're present with the Lord at the moment we pass. Our body goes into the grave to later be resurrected or go somewhere else, destroyed, burned, smithered, whatever, but it's rejoined with our spirit and we are eternally with God in a perfected, glorified body. But he, he, for the joy that was set before him, and so we need to understand the joy. Now, I want to just pause for a second and look at James chapter 1 because this joy is so important here. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it joy. No. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials, literally testing of our faith. All of the testing of our faith. So consider it all joy. Jesus suffered much. He endured 
so much. And as we go back to chapter 12 and, and verse 2, we look, if you will, all of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So that's who we need to put our focus on. So the third point begins back in verse 1 of chapter 12, and that is, this is, this is encouragement for us to exercise strong faith. We've seen faith, seen it in action. We've seen the good reports, if you will. Um, and we've seen the one who lived perfect, perfect in faith, Christ himself. And so if we want to be strong in our faith, we look at the examples, we looked at the line of perfect faith, and now we need an encouragement to do that ourselves. Chapter 1, I mean, excuse me, chapter 12 and verse 1. Seeing we also are compassed about, surrounded by these, this, these great uh, group or cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Now, weight is not sin here. Weight is not sin. Um... Uh, the word there could be encumbrance. It could be uh, hindrance. Let us lay aside every hindrance, specifically to the Jewish people who had been saved, put faith in Christ, who were immature in their faith, who this letter was addressed to. Their immaturity resulted from resor resorting back, like we studied in the book of Galatians not long ago, resorting back, if you will, to the Levitical sacrifices and the, and the law, and not the, not the supreme sacrifice of Christ, if you will, to be all in all. They were, still, they were still tied to the Levitical or the rituals, the ritualism, and, 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 all, and, and the days, and elevating certain days, and certain diets, and all those things. They resorted back to those things. We saw in the book of Galatians, a letter that was addressed to people who were trying to be um, who were trying to be conformed to that same pattern by being circumcised, etc., um, that that's a path of destruction. But we need to be wise and understand that Christ paid the price. He is the supreme sacrifice. No more sacrifices needed. It's not all these observances of times and days and of the law and of the feast and all those things. It's Christ. So we need to focus on him in verse 2. But it says we need to lay aside every weight, everything that would hinder us, whether it's idols and everything that gets between us and God is an idol. Doesn't have to be a little figurine that sits on a table or a desk or something. It's anything that gets between. It could be that God wants us to spend more time with him, but we don't have time. We don't set time aside. We don't have enough time for him. Time valued like that is a hindrance to serving him. Maybe God wants us to pick up from where we are and go do something different, whether it's a different location, whether it's a different vocation, whether it's a different path in our life. Uh, he wants us to do that. Maybe somebody considering marriage, maybe that's not the right person, but they have a preference for that person. And God said, no, 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 this isn't the right person. How many people do you know that married somebody who didn't have faith that they did, thinking that they could change them? That's not the right thing to do. Not the right thing to do. You're putting your hope into something that you don't know is going to happen. Put your hope in Christ because we know that it's the substance, it's the proof of things that are yet to come. But we're to get rid of all of these hindrances. Anything that would keep us from running the race uh, that's talked about here um, in, uh, in this verse. So we are to lay aside separate ourselves from every weight that is every hindrance and the sin now it's sin sin distracts us from god uh, it's damaging to our testimony it's damaging to our life yeah when sin when we do sin we're not going to live a perfect life when we do sin first john 1 tells us that we're to confess that sin if we say we're without sin there are people to do that who say well i can't sin anymore i'm saved by the grace of god well they're lying 1 John 1 8 says that. If you say that you have no sin, you're a liar. The truth of God is not in you. We do sin. When we sin, the believer, the true believer, will confess that sin. They'll recognize the sin. And if they don't recognize it because of their own knowledge, the Holy Spirit will reveal it. He'll convict us of that sin. And then we'll want to confess that sin. Confess means that we're not going to say to God that we're sorry about it. Well, I'm sorry about that, Lord. No. 
No, it's not ungodly sorrow. We're sorry because we got caught. We're sorry because we got convicted. What we need to do is confess the sin, which means to take up the same position that God does about the sin and hate it. When David prayed in Psalm 51, it was a prayer of contrition, real contrition. And that is a change of heart and a change of mind. So we confess it. We've changed our attitude towards that sin that we committed. We committed it. We liked it. We enjoyed it. So we're going to change our mind. You know, people have trouble with language sometimes and they still say, speak profanity. If you hated it, it would be gone. The problem is they just, they still use it, but they, they don't use it. Or they end up using it sometimes in the company of people and they say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, true contrition, a true confession means we're going to hate it. And if we're going to hate it, we're going to take up the same position God does concerning that sin. So we need to... Um, Lay aside the sin. Lay aside every weight. Lay aside the sin. With, and by the way, this sin and these hindrances so easily beset us. Easily beset is one word um, in, the, uh, in the original um, uh, Greek. And it literally means um, whatever hinders us. Whatever hinders us. Uh, that it ambushes us, if you will, and it encircles us so sometimes we get in a position maybe we're in a group of people that we're not really fond of but maybe we tolerate maybe in a group of family and they're talking about maybe the, some dirty jokes talking about you know how some some sins that they're committing and doing this and how much you're drinking or cavorting or whatever and we just sort of sit there and we tolerate it uh, we'd be careful that stuff is encircling us it's ambushing us and before you know it we're going to start laughing at the jokes that we shouldn't be laughing at we'll be comfortable in the scenario that we're in and we shouldn't be comfortable there we should want to get out of that and that's the laying aside that's a, a small example but you get the picture we need to lay aside the hindrances and the sin and do what and let us run this is, the, the word literally means swiftly, swiftly. Let us run, if you will. It's effort and perseverance. Let us run with patience. Boy, that's so key. Patience. Patience, we get a better perspective of it when we understand that the word literally means endurance. We endure. We endure. Have to endure through it. We get impatient when somebody does something that angers us and we get impatient with them. The Lord is the, is, is the avenger of all such, right? So we turn it over to the Lord. It's in the Lord's hands. We're not going to try to get back. We're not going to strike back. We're not going to talk back. We're not going to participate in the pettiness of the sin. So it requires patience to do that. That's endurance. So it's endurance in the face of sin, in the face of the most difficult of circumstances. We need to run. That is, we need to swiftly go with patience. The race, the race is demanding and grueling. Demanding and grueling. This is talking about a competitive race. Um, and Paul's believed to be the author of Hebrews by many. We don't know that he is. But we know that Paul talked about race in other places. Um, but the race is a, is a competition. And, I re, and I've been in races, and maybe some of you have been in races, but a race, it may be a car race, it may be a foot race, there's some kind of a competition that tries to get us ahead. We try to get, to the, we try to, to get more points. We try to you know, score lower in, in, in golf or whatever it might be. It's that, it's that running the race. It's that competition. We're to swiftly go in the competition, if you will, but that race that is set up for us, so it's not only a, a demanding and grueling effort, but it's lifelong. It's lifelong. We can never be off guard. Lifelong race that is set before us. Notice that this race is set before us. There's a path that God has designed for us to take. And in that path, whatever comes, we need to be patient and we need to always exercise faith. And we'll find ourselves with stronger faith if we do that. And so then we look at verse um, 3. We've already considered uh, verse 2 there. So in verse 3 there, it says, one word I want to focus on, consider. For consider him, him refers back to Jesus in verse 2. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. 
We need to consider that. The word consider means to contemplate. It means to study. It's a sustained and purposeful concentration, attention to details and minutia. It's that kind of consideration, detailed. Consider Jesus. When we look at the life of Jesus, why it's so important to examine the life of Jesus, not just look at this description of it in Hebrews 12, but to go back to the Gospels and look at the life of Jesus and to see what he did and how he handled every circumstance. Many times we see when he was asked a question, he didn't answer the question that was asked. He didn't reduce himself to the pettiness of that. He got to the truth of the matter. Um, sometimes we get, we get confronted with situations and we think we have to respond. We don't necessarily have to. We just need to take a course of, of honest, truthful, and faithful action that will be pleasing to God when we do. And that's what he did. Uh, so we need to consider him and consider his life. We can't do that without knowing what he did in the Gospels. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Why? The word less means in order to prevent the chance that you be wearied and faint in your minds. This is a race. We have to run, not be wearied. We've got to keep running. And the, the running is lifelong. It's a demanding and grueling process. It's lifelong. We have to continue to run that race that's been set before us. And we need to look to Jesus for a purpose and a definition and the wherewithal of how we ought to run the race set before us. He certainly had a race set before him that was very different. And so we need not faint, if you will. Um, so in verse 4, it sort of characterizes how we should run and how we should resist. It says, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And I believe this really means the shedding of blood. It's what Jesus did. He shed His blood at the cross for you and for me, for all the people of the world. He did that. He shed His blood. Look at the martyrs in the, in the New Testament. Look at all those martyrs. Old Testament martyrs. Look at, look at Stephen. It's a great example. He was still looking at Jesus. When they, when they were stoning Him to death, He was looking up into heaven. He was focused on Jesus with intent. And He said, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. What did Jesus say when he was at the end? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's where we need to be. People around us sometimes taunt us. They, they, they persecute us. They treat us meanly, despitefully. Uh, they, they go on about their evil ways even though they know we're in their presence. Uh, we get tempted by things that appeal to our desires and likes. But through all of that, we got to resist it. Continue to resist, even to the point of death. Even to the point of death. And Peter and John were threatened uh, by the Jewish people who, were, who didn't want them teaching in the name of Jesus. They didn't want that name of Jesus mentioned anymore. They prayed for boldness. They went back. And they, they said, it, it doesn't matter what you guys say. It's what God says that matters. And God says, preach the word. We're going to preach the word. So let's not faint, if you will, or fall back because somebody is opposing us. Christ did that. And the, 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 the apostles of the New Testament did that. The saints that we've seen mentioned in the Old Testament did that. And people of strong faith of all time have done that. And just don't cow down to the pressures around us. We need to exercise literally strong faith. Now, one more thing about this thing called considering Jesus. Uh, it necessarily uh, is talking about taking action. Not just in our mind, but necessarily taking action. Jesus was never one who was sitting back idly by and not participating in what was going on. Nope. He was taking action. The reason many times we don't take action, if we're going to be strong in our faith, we've got to take action. We sort of sit back. Things go on in the world around us, we don't talk about it. Why? Because it's unpopular. Uh, it's not accepted by the people around us. Uh, we can't speak out against abortion because people around me, they, they don't want me talking about that. They believe that I'm just a Jesus freak. And I, there's not a person I would be ashamed of saying abortion is murder. 
And I commonly and regularly say it. It is murder. I don't care who, who thinks differently about it. It doesn't matter. But strong faith has taken every circumstance, every circumstance as an opportunity to please God in what we do. And strong faith pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So there are times when we hold back on our faith to, to express, taking action on the things that we need to take action on because we're afraid of the people around us, the circumstances around us, or what might happen in expectation of what others might do in the face of us expressing our faith. All of those things, should we need to get rid of all those hindrances. Those are hindrances. We need to get rid of all of them. And the sin which so easily besets us. If we get rid of all of that stuff and we look to Jesus Focus on Him and we consider Him with intent to actively pursue faith as He did. Because He's the author and the perfecter of faith. Let's stand and bow together, if you will, in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for Your Word. We're thankful for Your encouragement, Your exhortation to go forward with even stronger faith than what we've had. And Father, we'll truly get to the point where we're exercising strong faith. The kind of faith that we see exercised by the, the ancients here in Hebrews 11 of Christ Himself and of others that we've read about in Scripture and of others that we know. Father, but first and foremost, may we focus upon Jesus, consider His approach to living faithfully to You. And Father, we just give You praise and thanks for teaching us today guiding us through the truth, and giving to us the wherewithal in order to accomplish that which you've encouraged us to do today. Because we know that with you that nothing is impossible. Because having stronger faith is certainly according to your will. So Father, we need to examine our own lives to see where we have failed as we're convicted of those failures, Father, that we would make changes and pursue that, in, that, that path a difficult and lifelong path, that race that is set before us with strong faith. Father, we just ask that as you've encouraged us, that we will respond appropriately and our lives will be changed from this point on. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.